Hello everyone, my name is Robert. Today I'm going to show you why Visual Studio is the best tool for every web developer. A little bit about me before I begin. I work in South Africa at BBD. I'm also a Microsoft MVP and Microsoft Visual Studio ALM Ranger, which means I get to work with Microsoft on various things that they ship to make the communities better. I'm also a very proud member of the developer user group. And we, we meet once a month over beer and pizza to discuss a variety of topics. In the last couple of months, we've discussed enterprise service buses, Ruby on Rails, de development practices and methodologies. And so we have quite a variety of different topics that we move through. So if you do live in South Africa, in particular, if you live in Johannesburg, have a look at our website at developerug.org.za and hopefully we'll get to see you there sometime soon. What I'm gonna talk about for the next 40 minutes to 50 minutes or so, really what I'm gonna to prove to you is Visual Studio is the best develop web development IDE. And I'm not just talking about things that sh ship in the box, technologies like ASP.NET, TypeScript, or JavaScript, which all ship with Visual Studio. I'm not just talking about how Visual Studio is the best for them. I'm talking about how Visual Studio is the best web development ID regardless of platform. And so if you're using other technologies like PHP, Ruby, CoffeeScript, Perl, any of these sort of other technologies, there are oftentimes extensions, and most of the time they're actually free as well, that plug into Visual Studio and you can get them from the Visual Studio Gallery. And this enables you to use these languages and these platforms within Visual Studio. And so a lot of what I'm gonna show you today applies directly to these other languages as much as it applies to what you traditionally think is a Microsoft language. So hopefully if you are using a different platform out there, this is stuff that you can make use of as well. As much as it's important to talk about the technology and show demos, which I'm gonna spend most of the time doing, the attitude of the company that produces the software is vitally important as well. We do need to look at how Microsoft has changed over the last couple of years in terms of their attitude and how that has impacted the development process. So there are three key aspects that I want to cover. Firstly, they have changed their behavior from shipping a big release sort of once every two years and then a couple of service packs that fixed bugs to this new cycle of shipping updates and releases all the time. We, about nine months ago, we got Visual Studio 2012 and in that time, we've had three major updates to the product. And these updates aren't just bug fixes like in the past. They include lots and lots of new features. By my count, which is completely inaccurate, I'm sure, there's at least 200 new features that have been added to Visual Studio since it's been released. We also have had Visual Studio 2013 announced recently. And so I'll talk about that in a moment as well. But really showing you that this isn't just about moving updates to keep the pack product up to date, it's about making sure that new releases get shipped on a quicker cycle as well, so Microsoft can respond to and work with the market better. A big feature as well is that they, they have decoupled things. So no longer do we have the problem of if the ASP.NET team wanted to ship new functionality, they would be required to wait for .NET to ship, which brings in huge problems. What happens if ASP.NET's already finished a new feature? Well, that feature just has to sit and wait. What happens if the ASP.NET team needs an extra month over the .NET deadline? Tough, that feature just didn't make the, the, the release. Now, the ASP.NET team has moved their deployment to NuGet, and they'll be able to update through NuGet, meaning as soon as things are done, they can ship. If they need extra time after release, they can ship after release. They're no longer bound by the time, timelines, which means they can respond to the market changes and techno technology changes a lot quicker. The same is true of Visual Studio. They are shipping these updates all the time to keep the product fresh, to keep the product up to date, to give you a lot of value in using the product. And so this decoupling has really made it a lot more streamlined and really improved the speed at which Microsoft works. Lastly, they have stopped this behavior of if it's not invented by Microsoft, we can't touch it. We can see that in two really good cases. One is, again, the ASP.NET team. They've embraced jQuery and Modernizer in the MVC projects. And while Microsoft could built their own JavaScript libraries to do that sort of same functionality. They decided to look at the best of breed out there and incorporate that and work with them. So Microsoft contributes to jQuery then, and they work with the modernizer guys to make sure that their libraries are the best possible and that Microsoft's helping them with their deliverables. A second area that shows this for me is just around Team Foundation Server. When the market started to move to a distributed version control, things like Git and Mercurial becoming very popular, Microsoft could have gone and developed their own DVCS, DVCS that would allow them to have full control over everything. But rather they looked at what the market was doing, what was going to win, what was important. And instead of building their own, they adopted Git. And so TFS 2013 ships with Git in the box 
and gives you the best enterprise Git solution available. And yet, at the same time, this isn't Microsoft Git, this is just normal Git, so it works with everything that normally works with Git. You don't need special tools or special plugins or some s sneaky hacks, it just works, and that is fantastic. That a belief that other people can do a job really well and we'll work with them and make it even better because they're the best out there is a great change in the way Microsoft works with the world. As I mentioned, Visual Studio 2013 and TFS 2013 have been recently released. In fact, it was just past this past Wednesday where they got uh, the previews released at Build, and there's lots of new features in there. Some of the highlights that I picked out for web developers, things like the new ASP.NET model, uh, the edit and continue for x64 options, and so on. But there were two that stood out for me above those. The first is the cloud-based load testing, where you can use the power of TFS service and Azure to spin up load test clients on, in the cloud and have them hit your website and have them run tests for you. And this means if you need to test your website against a large number of users, maybe 10,000, maybe 50,000, maybe a small amount, only 10 or 50, you don't need to have that many machines. You can use the Azure services and the cloud-based services to do that load testing for you. Secondly, for me, a very exciting one is Browser Link. And with Browser Link, the IDE injects a little bit of JavaScript in the form of Signal R into your web page. And now, as you edit the page in Visual Studio, and this is really easy because we have edit and continue for x64 now. When you hit save, it will refresh the browser automatically for you. And this isn't just an IE feature. This is a feature that is standards based. So it works in Chrome, in Opera, in Safari, in Firefox, and, ID, and IE. And what's great is if you have multiple of these browser windows open at the same time, when you hit save, it'll update all of them. This is definitely the sort of first idea in browser link. We see, so there is, we see opportunity here to do other things. Imagine filling in a form on one browser and having all the other browsers on the updating at the same time. So you could be able to test IE and Chrome at the same time. Same as, it, as if maybe you were scrolling down. So now your cross-browser testing becomes very, very simple and you can have this easy ability to do these things. This is all just some brand new preview stuff and I recommend you watch the build videos for more on this and keep an eye out for RTM later in the year which will obviously have a lot more functionality. So with that, talking about the history of uh, the product and the future of the product and the history of Microsoft and their attitude and where they, how they've changed. Let's look at the meaty part of today's demo, today's talk, which is the demo. And today we're going to build a web page because that'll give you a good feel for how it is to do web development regardless of platform. We're going to start off by building some HTML because everyone needs to do HTML. We're going to look at how we can improve some existing CSS I already have. And then how can we change that to less to get even more improvements in our CSS development cycle? Then as a way of having something interesting to build with JavaScript that's easily approachable, I thought we'd build the, build the blink tag with JavaScript so we can make some text just blink on and off. And this is a nice sort of simple thing to show you a lot of the cool JavaScript features. As much as that Visual Studio is about development and being a great web development environment, it's also a great tool for the whole of the application lifecycle management. So we, we need to look at features like the deployment, which is really important for your application lifecycle management. And throughout this, the key things I'm going to be using is Visual Studio 2012 with Update 2 applied. I'm going to be using the Git extension from Microsoft, which gives me great Git support. And I'm going to be using the Web Essentials extension from Mads Christensen, who works at Microsoft. And this is an extension that ASP.NET team uses to push out a whole bunch of ID, uh, ideas for the IDE. And the ideas that work really well get promoted. And you can see a lot of the stuff from Web Essentials is just standard now in Visual Studio 2013. So if you are unable to try it 2013 yet, get the Web Essentials extension and you get a feel for a lot of what's coming with 2013. So with that, let's switch across to Visual Studio. All right, so as I said, we're using Visual Studio 2012. And to show you I have nothing up my sleeve, we're going to create an ASP.NET empty web application. And it gets created nice and quickly for us. Now what I'm going to do is add this to source control. And because I have the Git extension installed, I get the choice of either having it in TFS or in Git, we'll choose Git. As you can see, we get all the great sort of standard Visual Studio source control stuff. So over here, I'm getting all my little plus symbols to tell me these files will be added. I can also go to the Team Explorer window, shows me exactly what's been added in here, and I can easily do a commit. What's great with this is this is just normal Git. It's not doing some special Microsoft flavor. This is normal Git on my machine. And I can go to commits now, 
put in the URL to a Git repository. That could be TFS service based, or as I often use, GitHub and Bitbucket. And what's great with this tool is that it takes away the bulk of the going to the command line for Git. So I can work in an ID, I don't have to context switch, and the common day-to-day -day functionality that I need to get is right here at my fingertips. I don't have to worry about switching contexts. Obviously, this doesn't cater for everything, so a good understanding of the Git command prompt is still recommended, and using the Git command prompt to do more complex things is still a good idea, but this covers that bulk of the stuff that you're doing within Git day-to-day, -day. and then you still have that command prompt available for the more complex stuff that you do on an irregular basis, or you do a lot less often so let's go back here because this is a website we need to add in some jquery which i think is just you know the requirement for every website nowadays so we're going to do that with nuget and what we're going to do is we're going to come up to here and we're going to search for jquery and we'll say install and nuget pulls it down and installs it into our application for us and what's great with nuget it's very much like tools like gems on ruby or uh, the Red Hat Package Manager on Linux is that it can tell us if there are updates. It can ha not only handle JavaScript, it can handle uh, .NET assemblies and other types, even things like images can all be put into there. And so you can easily go and get the content and make sure you have the latest up-to-date content. So you can see here, we have our jQuery scripts within our package already. Now let's go and add in some pre-built resources I've got. Uh, so we'll add a folder and what I want to add in here is a couple of files. Uh, let's grab my stuff here. We have a, a, some CSS. We also have two images. You know, as I hover over these images, I get little previews of them. And this is just some stuff that we're going to use for our demo today. Now let's go create a web page. Obviously, we'll call this index. And I need to start typing in here. And Visual Studio has support for snippets. So I can type in div, hit tab, and it gives me a div. I can type div C hit tab and it gives me a div with a class. Very useful sort of feature here to type stuff out quickly. I've actually moved away from snippets and started adopting something called Zen coding. It is also known by it, it's by another name called Emmet. And it, this is not just a Visual Studio feature. This is a way of defining HTML in terms of CSS and is available across multiple IDEs. So whether you're in Eclipse, Notepad++, TextMate, Sublime, there are extensions that allow you to make use of Zen coding in those platforms as well if it's not already baked in there. So let's create some HTML5 pages with Zen coding. So I type HTML colon five, hit tab, creates me a page. And now I wanna do that div thing again. So I'll type div, but I wanna specify the class this time as poster. So we'll do this the way we would in CSS. So it's div.poster, right? And there we go. Let's undo that. If I wanted a child element in CSS, I'd go uh, angle bracket there. And now I wanna type in another div with a class of logo, div, div logo. There we go. See how it starts working? I can do a sibling in the form of a plus, same as CSS, and we'll go div title. And then this should have an H1 element under it. And here we break from the CSS sort of features. And we have ability to type in text using per these curly braces here. And so we'll just finish typing this out. So here we can see we've got uh, development. There we go. Nice little simple string, easy to think about. You don't have to context switch between CSS and J, the way that sort of jQuery selectors work and your HTML. Now you've got a nice sort of unified thinking. And once I hit tab, it just fills that all out for me. Now what I want to do is just add in some pre-existing uh, HTML because you don't want to see me spend the next two minutes just typing. So we'll just paste that in. All right, so now I've pasted that in and now I want to format it so I can hit Control KD and it'll just line everything up for me. Very, very useful, the whole, uh, feature of that. Let's finish this HTML off by bringing our CSS. And because Visual Studio sees this as a CSS file, I just drag it on, it creates a link tag for me or link element. The same is true for my images because there are images. If I just drag them on, Visual Studio will give me the correct image tag. And note how I dragged it sort of somewhere over here, but it's still aligned it correctly. It gives me that good alignment and the those good features. So this is really cool in terms of making sure it's very easy to bring in assets into your web pages. Visual Studio is also pretty smart about this idea of linked tags now. So I can click on this top div here and note that it's got this sort of purple, uh, this gray color background, but so does the bottom one that it's linked to. So these two guys are linked together. And note, I'm gonna to start to edit this guy up at the top here. 
watch what happens to the bottom one as I change its type from a div to a paragraph. See, they both changed. Really easy to sort of update, which is pretty cool. You'll note though that immediately as I did that, I started getting warnings. Visual Studio is smart about our uh, HTML in terms of giving us errors, so I could actually go either there or to here. And it tells me exactly that these divs should not be nested under an element. That's not valid HTML, which is pretty cool. So let's undo that, we'll fix that up. But this is not just about simple things of do not put divs uh, under paragraph tags. This is about more complex things as well. So we can do things like the big element, um, big, which no longer exists in HTML5. And you can see here, I just, if I hover over that, it tells me it's not supported. The reason it's validating against HTML5 is because it's analyzed my doc tag and just said, well, that's the HTML5 doc type, that's what you want to use. I can change this though to be always set to uh, HTML4 for instance. And now the big element is accepted where I'm getting some warnings around my image element that's missing something. And we can switch this back. So there's intelligence around the HTML validation. Really trying to make sure that it's easy for you to write the correct HTML all the time and that your uh, content's always gonna be up to date. So that's pretty cool. What I wanna do now is see what this web page looks like. So I'll hit F5 which will launch it in IE, obviously, because it's a Microsoft product. And you see, here's my web page. But one of the best things they've done in Visual Studio 2012 is to add in support for other browsers. So I've hit the little drop down next to my run button there, you'll see I have multiple options. I have Google Chrome, because it found that on my machine. And if I had Safari, Opera, Firefox, or any other major browser, it will automatically add it in there. We also have another tool in there called Page Inspector, which is a tool specifically for ASP.NET MVC developers to make their lives a lot easier. We also have emulators, which allow us to test this against things like iPads and iPhones without actually having to run an iPad or an iPhone. So I'm able to run something that simulates or work, gives me the experience of those browsers, the right resolutions and the right sort of Chrome around them, but without actually having to have a machine dedicated to that. So that's very cool. There's also the browse with option, which is very important. Not only can we use this to add in custom browsers, so maybe I wanna have a browser that's not very popular or not well known, I can add it in here easily, but I can also use this to launch popular browsers like Chrome with specific command lines. Maybe I wanna set it to a specific resolution. Maybe I wanna set it to, a spe to have specific extensions added or not. I can do all of that in here. I can also set my defaults, and I can also select all of these and say, you know, launch with all these browsers. And now it will launch multiple browsers at the same time. So I don't have to select just one and then go back and select another. If I'm doing cross browser testing, this becomes an easy way for me to launch multiple browsers. Just to show you that this works, we're gonna to switch to Chrome for the rest of the demo and just have it launch in Chrome. So we'll hit F5 and note it launched very happily within Chrome. So hopefully through this first part of the demo, I've shown you that HTML is very easy to write, particularly when using snippets and encoding, and also all the validations really making it a lot simpler, and that Microsoft's really embracing the idea of there are lots of browsers out there, and we need to work with them. So let's switch to the CSS and have a look at the CSS, because that's the second major theme for this demo. So we'll open up the CSS we already have, nice piece of CSS, what hopefully jumps out at you straight away, are these little swatches of color here. They show us exactly what the color is, and we can click on that, and it will give us a little color picker. And what's great with this color picker, as I try to zoom in, it will do that, do that again. Oop, there we go. Is that these guys here, these first ones up to this little bar, these are the colors from within my document. A lot of the time you need to have the same colors within your CSS. So the tool is smart enough to scan your CSS, find all the colors in the document. So if I need to change it to our specific blue that we're using, I just select that and I'll get the right blue throughout my document. I just keep using these swatches. These guys after here are just all the primary colors. So we'll do that zoom out there. And you can see I can scroll along and go to any other sort of primary colors. And we could select one of those if I wanted to. I'm gonna set the drop down here. And there I can use the color picker, which is really smart in terms of picking out the right color. I can add in opacity, which is also really quite cool. I can use the little color picker dialog here to select from the colors in Visual Studio or from anywhere else on my screen. So let's select this really horrible color there and easily pick out the colors I want. The color tools are not just limited to using hex colors. We can obviously do things like normal named colors for HTML, or we can do uh, colors like R uh, RGB colors. So we can say whatever, 20, 30, 20, 50. Ooh, it's kind of like a dark color. 
And what's great is as I use the tool here to move around, it stays in my preferred format. So it hasn't switched back to hex. It respects what you're doing and will attempt to stay in the same sort of place you're working. So if you're working with hex, it stays as hex. If you're working with RGB, it stays as RGB. Let's put this back to our original color just because we don't want any of these other colors. So that's pretty cool. We also get UI hinting in terms of fonts. We can hover over font and see exactly what the font would look like at various resolutions. And so, or various font sizes. So we can get a good idea of what the font looks like and how that's going to work, which is pretty cool. We also get snippet support in here as we did with HTML. So I can come down to the poster class here and I can type in transform, tab, tab, and note it's added in not only the transform tag, but the tags for all the other browsers. And using features from the Web Essentials extension, I can hover over these and it'll show me exactly what browsers are supported. So you can see that the standard tag is supported in Firefox 16 and above, IE 10 and above, and Opera 12.5 and above. And as I hover over the other ones, you'll see which ones they're all supported in, which is pretty cool. I can start to type in here and you'll see all of them start to update. And you'll note that I'm getting IntelliSense while I'm doing this. So it tells me exactly what it's going to do. I can hit tab to finish that off. And we'll type that in. And so the whole time it's trying to make your life a lot easier in terms of editing and applying these sort of tags into here. If we scroll down, you'll see here we've got a div title tag and then we've got some of these child ones. And so one of the cool things we can do is once again, we can do that formatting. So control KD and it's formatted the CSS for us. You'll note that it's just indented these tags. These are obviously children of this sort of div tag. And this indent indentation here is not meant to uh, do anything functionality wise. It's just meant as a designer, somebody working with CSS, you get a visual clue that these are children of the above tag. And so it just makes it easier to read. Let's go down, uh, let's go up a little bit here. Here you can see that image we brought in uh, from our assets and I can hover over that and you can see it gives us a real time re preview of that. It's gone to the file system, loaded that up and previewed it. What's really great with images particularly when you use small ones, you can now embed them into your CSS because we really want good performance. And performance in web pages is made up of a number of factors. Two of the big factors, are obviously the size we're sending down, and second is the number of connections we are using. The more connections we use, the slower things get. So we can't change the size of this image much, but what we could do is take it away from being downloaded separately. And so what I'll do is do control dot and say embed and now what it's done is it's put its base 64 encoded that image into here. And you can see there's the whole image. So I haven't saved much on size, but now when the browser has downloaded the CSS, it will have also downloaded the image and be able to use it. So it doesn't need that fallback option. And same way I can hover over the fallback option here. You can see it's added in a fallback for older browsers. I can hover over the base 64 one and it will decode that at the same time. So how can we sort of look at another way of improving the speed? As I mentioned, file size is important. So this, this file has lots of uh, white space and things that make sense for me as a developer, but really we don't want to ship this like this. So we can use that web essentials. We can right click here and say minify and it'll create me a minified version, which takes up a lot less disk than the one that I'm working with. What's great with this is as I'm saving in here and editing in here, it's going to automatically update the minified version for me. So now on my web page, I have that updated version uh, I can use that minified version without having to manually go and update it all the time, which is really cool. As I mentioned though, I don't use CSS anymore. I use less because I find less is a much better tool. So let's cut all of this out of here. Less is just a language that is based on CSS. So all normal CSS is already less and less just gives us a bunch of extra features. You'll see we get this cool two panel uh, view here. Let's get rid of that toolbox. We'll just paste in our, our existing CSS, hit save, and we get our CSS here. And there's been a couple of minor changes. Note we've got some spacing changes here, which just compacts it a little bit. But also if we have a look down here to our div title, because that wasn't doing anything, it's already stripped that out for us. So it tries to make life a little bit smarter for us, which is cool. More than that though, it, does, it can offer us some very cool tricks. So I'm using this uh, purple color on multiple times in our document. So what I want to do is change this from being uh, specified repeatedly in our document. We'll change this to, let's copy that into the clipboard, a variable. Uh, actually, let's use the find and replace tool. So we'll find and replace to at Visual Studio purple. And we'll hit replace and it will replace both places in our document. If I have to hit save now, 
you'll see I get an error for our CSS because less doesn't know where this variable is defined. So I get really good support for less. And this is really included in just Visual Studio. This isn't part of an extension anymore. And so now what I can type in here, we'll specify this variable and I can paste that color in there, hit save and note that it's now gone in here. Wherever I've specified this variable, it's gone and placed that color in for me. And this gives me a single location to work with that color. So I don't have to keep repeating that color over and over again in there. Next thing we can do in less is just fix up this piece here. So while this is great uh, to have, we can use sort of almost like classes here. I can wrap all of this within the div title and get rid of these guys. And before I hit save and let it regen the CSS for me, what I want you to note is this is what the output looks like. We don't get the div title element uh, or class here. We get these two ones. As I hit save, there's no real change here. It, it outputs the same thing, but now we get a very nice way to see how these things are related between child and parent. And I can also sort of collapse and expand the whole thing now, which is really useful. Lastly, we can also do functions in there. So this is a slightly darker purple that I use. Maybe I just want to have this programmatically specified. So I can use a darken function and I can pass in my Visual Studio purple variable. I get IntelliSense for that. And we can tell it how much we want to darken it by, in this case, 15%. Let's save and note I get a slightly darker color there. It's 15% darker. If I bring up all three of the color purples here, so you can see we've got our Visual Studio purple, our Visual Studio purple, and our darker purple. Where this all really just works well is now, if I go back to that variable, I change it in one place to say the green, hit save, note it's changed everywhere in my document, I even get that darker one. And so this becomes really nice as a programming tool. So we can sort of have programming constructs with CSS. Obviously, because we need to work with CSS, it generates the CSS automatically for me, and it also generates a minified one. So as I'm typing and saving things, it's gonna generate a minified one. So I don't even have to worry about doing that first step with CSS and minified, less will handle that for me. So we get that going on for us, which is pretty cool. Right, so hopefully what I've shown you there is CSS and less make life very, very easy when you're trying to start your applications. Lastly, let's look at JavaScript. So let's go into here. We'll add a JavaScript file. Uh, we want to create a blink tag, so we'll call this blinky. And now I want to, this is going to be built as a jQuery plugin, so I'm gonna hit dollar because I want to use jQuery. And then IntelliSense says, I don't know what to do. We don't know what dollar is. So to fix that up, I can just drag on JavaScript libraries now. And we get a comment in here. And the great thing about a comment is that every uh, browser just knows to ignore this. So if I had to ship this, it wouldn't impact the browsers. So that's pretty cool. Now if I hit dollar though, because we've added that reference in, it's added in all the IntelliSense. I could also specify a references file that would give me one place to specify all the common JavaScript libraries for my project. And then every time I saw a new JavaScript uh, file, it would automatically have all the references I need from that central location. So let's go and build this as a jQuery plugin. So we're going to define our plugin this way. And note that I'm getting sort of all my indentations and all my brackets and everything happening the whole time here. And as I type in like jQuery, it knows what jQuery is. And so everything is getting sort of specified and it's fixing it up and making it really work well for me. And once again, IntelliSense for jQuery and the functions in there. And we're gonna call this the Blinky function, we'll type in function, open close. And there is our little function in there. Uh, we actually probably don't need that there. Let's save. Actually, we might need that in a moment. You can see here, it's telling me in my error list, I've got missing a semicolon. So we're getting some hinting about what is going on with our jQuery, which is pretty cool. Making sure our jQuery is always correct. Uh, we want to return this from the function because this is a jQuery function. And now what I want to do in here is I want to call a method that's going to update uh, the status of a, or the visibility of an element every half a second. So we'll use the set interval function in JavaScript and we'll call the method toggle and every half a second and that will be the element. So let's go build that toggle function. And so it'll be a private function in this case, so we'll say toggle and we need to know the target. And a lot of the time you will find JavaScript like that, what does this mean? What is the toggle? What is the target? How do we know how to use that. If we have a look here in the IntelliSense, we do get toggle, but it doesn't tell us anything. So it's looking at the JavaScript, figuring out what's going on, but not really giving us much more. What I should be able to do now is control KX, go to our XML comments and be able to type in a summary. And now we can say we th what this will do. So it'll toggle the visibility of the target using jQuery. And so what's great is now I'm sort of building up documentation for my 
JavaScript. And so it becomes easy to understand what's going on and what's expected, which is pretty cool. And there's a lot of this sort of intelligence in here. So if I had to go and create a variable in here, uh, let's call this variable foo, and it's a number. If I type foo dot, it knows it's a number, so I get functions like two fixed and two precision, which are all number-based sort of options. If I change this to a string, then I type foo again. Note I get all the sort of IntelliSense for strings, font colors and sizes and things like that. Obviously, this is, J, uh, this is JavaScript, so I can type to fixed, and it'll let me do that because it's a dynamic language, and I may have added that function in already. So I have the ability to go and extend this and work with this. It's not going to stop me from doing things in a dynamic way, which is pretty cool. Let's leave that there for a moment. Um, and maybe I want to do something. We can do the same with our target. If we have a look at target at the moment, target dot, it doesn't know what it is because we haven't given any intelligence to that. So what I can do here, once again, using XML commenting so that the browsers ignore it, I can type in some hinting for it. So in this case, we'll just tell it as a type of string. And if I type in target, I can say dot, and I get all my string methods. If I come back here, change this to jQuery, which is what we're going to be using, I can hit dot, and I get all the jQuery functions. So now I can just say target.toggle, which is pretty cool. This is not just limited to simple things like variables. We can do more complex things. Uh, at the moment, I can type delete and foo and it would let me get away with that because that's a valid piece of javascript however if i put in the use strict option for our class or our namespace here you'll see i instantly get a warning saying that delete is not valid in strict mode so it knows what mode of javascript i'm running in as well and can then work with that lastly it's even it's not just aware of the javascript but it's also aware of the html5 dom so if i have to create an element it will say document dot create element in this case we'll do a div to start off with if I like foo dot I get all the all the attributes of an HTML5 div so if I want to look for it like say source you'll see here I get a data source and I get a region and flow and things like that if I have to change this to an image tag or image element and type source source let's do it that way you'll note that I get different sources that are relevant to that image element so here's the one that would let me specify the actual image and so it's not only aware of the JavaScript, but the HTML as well at the same time, which is pretty cool. So we can save at this point. Um, now we need to sort of make sure that this, we send down the smallest amount to the browser. So we all right click on here and we can say Web Essentials, minify, and it'll minify the JavaScript for me as well. What's great with this though, is it also creates me a map. So I could ship this and the map file is only loaded in the browser when I'm actually debugging my JavaScript and it will convert the functions from these weird mapping names to their actual JavaScript functions. It really makes life a lot easier when you're trying to debug minified JavaScript. So we get that there as well. And same as with the CSS, as I'm editing this and hitting save, it'll update both of those. We can take this a step further. I mentioned that with the CSS, you know, we want to minimi minify the, the content to make it faster so we have less going down the line. We also want to minify how many times we send things down the line. In this case, I'm setting both jQuery and Blinky down. So what I can do is right click on them and create a JavaScript bundle file. We'll call this boom, hit enter, and now we've created the boom bundle file. And we have this uh, XML file that defines it. If I save here, you'll see it's gone and created me the uh, single JavaScript file with both of those in there, a minified version and a mapped version of that. So I have a single file now to send out. You could do this as well with ASP.NET MVC on the server side. So you don't have to do this at development time. Uh, you can have the server handle it, but it's actually pretty cool that you can do this in development time as well. So we can have a single file. So what I can do now is just drag on this. Uh, we'll do the minified version actually. Let's drag on the minified version. That comes into there. Using a snippet now, let's bring that in. I hit dollar. It knows about the jQuery selector because it's got that boom JavaScript file in there. So because we've added a reference there through the, the standard JavaScript way, it knows how to work with that. So now I'm going to use my selectors. And I'm going to say uh, div dot reminder once again using that same CSS selector language that I used to define my HTML with Zen coding and the same language I used in my CSS. So I have that consistent train of thought, and I should be able to type Blinky. There's my extension coming in because it came from that boom file. So we've got all of that set up. Let's actually have a look at how this looks at this point. So here we go, and you can see here is our page. We've got that rotation transform on there. We've got our cool little blinking text. Everything is working fantastically now within the browser.
So we really have finished what we wanted to build there. And because we've finished, what we're going to do is just check this in. So we'll go back to our changes. Uh, and we'll type in a commit. You'll note that I've got all my files that are going to be included here, as well as untracked files. And these are files that jQuery has pulled down for me. With, uh, not, sorry, these are files that NuGet has pulled down for me. So I could be able to include these files into my repository. Some people like to do that with NuGet, to have everything in the repository. Other people prefer not to have their NuGet files in their repository and use the feature of NuGet that says, hey, when you open up this project, if there are any missing references, we'll automatically download, download those for you. So you have the option with that with NuGet, you pick how your workflow works and the tools agree with that and we'll let you do that. And so here we can now easily commit this and we're almost done. Final thing is how do we get this to production? Very simply what we'll do, we'll go up to our project here, right click on that and we'll go to publish. And this takes us to the publish wizard. Firstly, we have to specify a profile. The idea behind profiles is we might have one for dev, one for QA, one for production, maybe one for different environments. Um, so we'll go in here and we'll add in a new profile. We'll just add in a demo one. We can choose our, our profile option here. We have five ways to get it to us to the target. We can use front page extensions if you still have really old servers. We all use we could use the file system. Maybe you're publishing to a network share or maybe you're publishing to a uh, drive on your own machine. We can use FTP. Um, but really the two exciting ones for me are the web deploy options. So we have web deploy and web deploy package. We're gonna do web deploy package. I'm just gonna create a file on my machine that has everything it needs in it. And we'll look at that in a moment. But web deploy itself will do the same thing. It'll create the package, but then it takes that package and puts it onto the target server for you automatically and automatically executes. It. Obviously your server admin has to opt in for this that, to allow you to do this. Uh, but for maybe QA and, and development environments this is something you can easily get in for production environments maybe it's not something that's easy for your server admins to allow but it can really help you in other worlds obviously all of this is backed by command line tools so you can easily integrate this web deploy thing into your uh, favorite build server so you can have continuous integration to your QA uh, dev or even to your production server if you have a very modern sort of dev team so let's go here and what we'll do is we'll create a new folder to put this in on the desktop and we can specify what we want our website to be called in here the next page we can specify our configuration options which allows us to uh tell it tells visual studio which configuration file to use no longer do we have just the web.config we have a multiple web.configs we have a standard one that's always used and then we have bits and pieces that we can have added in or changed depending on our connection uh, our target platform so if i'm doing a debug build maybe it has the connection string to our debug environment. If I'm doing a release build, maybe it has a connection string to our production environment. And I don't have to go and edit the config file manually. I can just have it automatically be transformed. And we have lots of other options here, which I'm not going to sort of go into today, but you can really configure a lot of what needs to be done. If I had any databases, they would be listed here. And once again, I get lots of options around when it's deployed. Do we drop the old database and just deploy a new one? Do we run alter scripts to update it? What happens on conflicts? All of that can be controlled here as well. So we can hit publish. This will publish and it's going to create us an output folder. If we have a look at that, you'll see we get a zip file with everything we need in it. I don't suggest ever opening these zip files. They're the most ugly thing you'll ever see inside. Uh, we also get some XML manifest files to help explain what it is. We get a nice readme file to explain how to deploy this. And then we get a 15 kilobyte batch file because we really want something that can scare the living daylights out of people. What's great with this is that it really guides uh, somebody who's going to use this to get on their server easily. So uh, you give this to your admin and he runs the batch file with whatever command line he options he wants, which he can read from the readme file. And this will either let it just automatically deploy on the server or give him the ability to turn off things. So, or even prompt him for every single step. So I can prompt it to say, we want to deploy to this location. We want to apply these file system permissions so that the browser can, uh, that this IIS web server can work with it. We want to use this specific web server, IIS or IIS Express. We want to make these changes to the server. And he can say yes or no through all of those as he goes along and give him the control to make sure the environment's still being managed the whole time. So in terms of having a way to get your websites onto servers, the new deploy features make it, make it really, really easy. So that brings me to the end of the demo. Let's just jump back to the slides and have a recap. So to recap, hopefully what I've shown you is that when you're developing for web development in Visual Studio, you're always gonna be a really happy person. CSS, definitely a pleasure to work with, but obviously less is even better. 
and I hopefully have shown you that less MTSS are both first class citizens in the Visual Studio IDE nowadays. So encoding or emit is just a fun and fast way to generate your HTML and make sure all your HTML is ready to go whenever you need it. JavaScript is a first class in Visual Studio. More than that, it's also important to remember that Microsoft is pushing JavaScript heavily for Windows 8 app development and all the investments that the Windows team and the team that are working around app development are doing for JavaScript means that we get that as web developers just for free. So there's a huge investment in making JavaScript the best development language there. Web Deploy made it really easy to get our code from our machine to our various environments, be they QA or dev or production. And lastly, Microsoft really is loving Git nowadays. Best sort of IDE integration, best sort of server side Git tooling as well. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to watch this short video. And if you have any feedback, please send it to me over Twitter. Uh, you can also get all the slides. You can get the completed demo. You can get my demo scripts and everything I use to make this happen. You can download it all from my website at sadev.co.za. So thanks so much and have a great day.